Father, we ask you to teach us what it means to surrender completely to you. So often we, we utter words, but in reality it's not the case, Lord. But we ask this morning that you would teach us what that means, to surrender all to you. So, Lord, we pray that you would come and speak into our hearts this morning. Holy Spirit, come and change attitudes, come and change thought patterns, come and change whatever's not in alignment in our thinking, in our spirits, Lord. We ask you to come and realign that. And we forgive you, we ask you to forgive us where we have where we have not completely given our lives to you and where we have not surrendered fully to you, Lord. And this morning we choose to do that anew and afresh. Speak into our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, welcome everyone. Good to have you guys with us and I trust that you ready for God to speak into your hearts and to your spirits and that you'll allow him to bring change. A special warm word of welcome to the YouTube watchers and the people that listen via iTunes and podcast. I would like to ask you, how is anything of great significance ever accomplished on earth? Through what is, is something great accomplished? Work, okay. Hard work, dedication. Prayer, research, commitment, perseverance. What else? Nothing of greatness was ever accomplished without commitment. Never. Unless you are committed to something, it will never be a full success. Never, ever, ever. And commitment separates the doers and the dreamers. So often you have guys, I'm going to do this in a company, but they, they, there's no commitment for them to follow through on that. And we need to understand that in life, without commitment, nothing will ever succeed. If the church is not committed to the call of God on their lives, the church will never succeed. If the church does, is not committed to the purpose for which it has been placed here on earth, it will never succeed. Right? There was once upon a time, because let me, I'm not getting through on this message, there was once upon a time this um, chicken and this hog, and they were walking, a pig was walking along the road, and they passed the church and they see, saw a sign there, um, take care of the poor. And they were walking along and they carried on, and the the chicken suddenly had a great suggestion, so he thought. So he says to the pig, to the hog, he says, how about us blessing the poor? So, he, so the pig says, and how do you intend to do that? He said, how about us blessing them with egg and bacon? <laughs> so the hog said, the pig said to, 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 uh, to, to the chicken, that's fine for you because for you it's a contribution, but for me it's full commitment. Do you contribute or do you, are you fully committed? Are you fully committed in your relationship with God? I think most of you are well aware that when, if you are a pilot flying an airplane, there comes a point on the runway where you have got no option but you are committed to the air, where you have to literally pick up. Or otherwise, what happens? There comes a point where there's the end of the runway. And all of us have to realize there comes a line where God draws in the sand and says, here is your line. I will tolerate this and no more. Hello? And I think it's sad in the church today that we do not see 100% commitment anymore. There are some that are 100%. I acknowledge that. But I'm talking about the universal church being 100% committed to the calling of God on their lives and their relationship with Him. 
I don't see the commitment that there should be. And God wants to challenge all of our hearts in that regard where there are areas in our lives, and I think in all of our lives, we need to be challenged in this regard continuously. Because we can start becoming uncommitted in this part of our relationship with God or in that area. And God wants to say, hey, and may He shake us this morning and may He expose areas in our lives that we are not fully committed. That we can say, Lord, I repent. I choose to be fully committed once again in this area. I believe that very few people understand what real commitment is. Do you understand what full commitment is? Most people don't understand that. And I think, for instance, the divorce rate clearly states that people don't understand what commitment is. They say that there's over 50%, I would say in this country, at least 75% of this nation are divorced today. I don't care what the stats say, because the stats work purely on what the home affairs statistics say. Please go and you ask those that work for you, some of you that have employees, some of you that have colleagues, who of them have not been registered at the home affairs? Who of you have uh, people that work for you? or friends that have never ever been registered at the Home Affairs. I have numerous people working for me that, have n that are married and divorced, and married and divorced, but they've never done it at the Home Affairs. So the stats that they give us are not correct. They are way worse than what you and I think. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but it's the truth. Now when you get married, what do you do? You choose to commit yourself, what? Wholeheartedly, completely, till death do you part. That is commitment. Is that based on a belief system that I will be with you forever? Or is it based on feelings? Not on feelings. Oh, interesting. Is it based on feelings? No. It's based on a decision. I choose to commit myself to you till death do me part. But what happens if suddenly my feelings change? Uh, 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 uh. I'm not b basing my commitment on my feelings. I'm basing my commitment on my belief that this is a commitment till death do us part. Hello? Therefore, commitment has always got to be based on not what I feel, but what I believe. Derek Q. Saunders once said, feelings are like sales prices. They are subject to change without notice. Isn't it so true, hey? <laughs> they fluctuate and they change without just suddenly, wh what, the price is up. Now, if you act the way you wish you felt, eventually you'll feel the way you act. But I don't feel like doing that, but I'm to do it. I don't feel like lo loving my wife and treating her the way Christ loved the church, but I'm not going to but I'm not going to react according to my feelings. I'm going to react according to the truth of what I'm called to do, and that's to love my wife as Christ loved the church. And eventually, I will feel like doing it. My feelings will follow. Amen? And we have to live like this, church. The problem is, so often, we base our decision-making and our commitment on our feelings. And it is totally out of line. And some people say, but that is hypocritical. But no, hypocrisy is not, and I put it on screen for you that you can think about it. Hypocrisy is not acting contrary to the way you feel. Hypocrisy is acting contrary to what you believe. If you believe that commitment is 100%, then you will be committed 100%. And you will not allow your feelings to get in the way. When we, uh, when we say, I'm 100% committed, but our actions don't display that, we are being hypocritical. 
So how many times are you hypocritical in your relationship with God? How many times am I hypocritical in my relationship with God? Point A. Commitment is a heart and a head decision. And true commitment always precedes achievement. If you want to achieve anything, you have to choose first to be committed. Okay, so would you read with me in Romans 6 verse 7 to 8? I'm use reading, this is the only scripture in the New American Standard Version. It reads in there, verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. You, from your heart, you became committed to what you've been taught. Okay, and what you've been equipped in, and have been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You and I need to choose to become slaves and committed 100% to a righteous lifestyle. I choose to be committed to God 100%, and in a sense, a slave to godliness, of doing what is right, what is true, what is noble, what is just, that is a choice that comes first from the heart uh, from the heart, and then to the head, where I say, I acknowledge this, this is the way I'm going to live. So I believe it is both a heart and a head decision. Point B, commitment means complete dedication. Not half-hearted, 25%, 35%, 95%, but complete. We read in 2 Chronicles 31, verse 20 to 21, it says, here, This is how Hezekiah did throughout Ju Ju Judah, doing what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. In everything he undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and the commands, he sought his God and worked wholeheartedly, he worked completely, committedly, he was full out for it. And then it says there, And so he prospered so God blessed him and he was prosperous but it starts in first and foremost choosing to be committed I choose to be committed I have a successful marriage because I've chosen to be committed to my wife through thick and thin I do not base my love for her on my feelings I base it on the commandment that God says I'm to love her as Christ loves the church do I sometimes not feel like that no, I don't. If she's nasty to me or s snappy to me, that I choose to love her. Do I sometimes fail? Yes. But the bottom line is I've made a mental and a heart decision. I will remain committed to you forever. And it is crucial that all of us get to that point. And every single one of us have boxed up in this area. So there's no condemnation if you have failed in this regard with your uh, spouse or a previous spouse or a previous spouse. The issue is from here on out, I choose to be committed to what God has called me to be, be committed in. And whatever that may be, okay? So do not see it as a thing of condemnation. It, it is a thing of I need to take from my life from here on out and be committed to that which he's called me to be committed I don't know if you've heard a saying that goes like this. A half-hearted farmer gets what? Gets weeds. A half-hearted farmer gets weeds. Have you never heard that? So maybe we should look, pa when, when you go past a farmer's uh, place full of weeds, then you must know maybe he's half-hearted. <laughs> what, what about your heart? What about your relationship with God? Are there any weeds there? May God eradicate the weeds in our lives as we come be become fully committed to Him. In James 1 says, He is a double-minded man, unstable in all His ways. When we, one, one minute like this, we believe God, and then we doubt God. We need to be stable. God said it, I choose to believe it and act on it. Amen. Right. Commitment can be improved. Do you know that? I can improve in my commitment in many areas. What about yourself? And to do that, you must measure it. So now, how do we measure our commitment, let's say, with God? 
How, do, how would you say? How can you, how can you evaluate yourself you with your commitment with God? What are some things that you could look at or questions you could ask yourself? How much time do you spend with God? Is that measurable? Yes, it is. Good one. What else? Sorry? How f how's your faith with God? How do you trust Him implicitly and explicitly, completely? When He says this, do you doubt Him? Or is it sure and amen? Because He said it, that settles it in my heart. What else? How much do you pray? How much do you communicate with Him? How much do you talk with Him? How much do you invest in intimacy with Him? And pray is talking to God. And not vain babbling, it's talking to Him and t talking is a two-way stream where we need to allow Him the opportunity to speak into our lives as well. Amen? Right, what else? What are other things that we can evaluate our commitment in with? Reading the Bible. Do you study God's Word? Do you invest time for him to speak into your life through his word? What else? Or how obedient are you? When he says this, do you do it? What else? How do you spend your money? Did God say you must, may spend it on that? There are many different ways. In one... You, one you, you need to assess your own relationship with God. And you need to say, right, Lord, where are th areas in my life I'm not measuring up? And this is not a heavy, this is a thing is, I want to get better. Isn't it? When you evaluate your business and you see, but this is the situation, how do I improve or take it to this level? You've got to ask pertinent questions that can take you there. Amen? Then point B, decide what's worth dying for and then commit to it. Tell me what do you think is worth dying for? Politics? Your country? Certainly not. Although I'm part of a different country, the kingdom of God. For that kingdom it's worth dying for, yeah? For God it's worth dying for. Your family, is that worth dying for? Your loved ones? What is worth dying for? And then what is worth dying for? Be committed to them. Be committed to that. So there are many different ways that you can go and have a look at and evaluate your life. And accordingly, you can reassess and rechange your life. It was not what Hezekiah s said or thought that brought blessing. It is what he did. And we can say and do... and. Believe all these things, but if it does, it does not take place in our action, in our daily life, it is meaningless. Okay. James 1 verse 23 to 25 says, Anyone who listens to the word of God but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Almost like he's senile, isn't it? Or dementia or whatever. Verse 25, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, interesting, hey, this is in the New Testament, by the way, and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard and doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Not might be blessed, he will be blessed. When God says, I, I want this, I want you to do this, my son or my daughter, and you do it, he will bless you because of your obedience. So, this morning's title is Committed Beyond Feelings. Becoming committed beyond what you feel. We need to get to a point of, I'm going to be committed to the call of God on my life in this area, this area, this area, this area, irrespective of how I feel. So I've written about six points, and let me tell you there's many more you can put, okay? But we're not going to do that for sake of time. You go before God and say, Lord, what are other areas that you want me to be committed? I've put in just a couple which I would think are on more the important side. So firstly, be fully committed to loving God. Be fully committed in your relationship with Him. We read in Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. 
Tell me, what does it mean when it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart? What does that mean? What does all mean? Everything. Nothing reserved. When it says all your soul, what does it mean? Partially. No, it means all of your heart. I mean, all of your soul means your mind, will, and emotion. All of your mind. Do you sometimes think things that are out of line with God's word? Do you sometimes think things that actually shouldn't be thought as a child of God? And there we need to say, Lord, sorry, I let go. I choose to let go. This is not of you. And all of us fall in a trap from time to time, and we need to immediately grab a hold of that, let it go. Take every thought captive that does not belong to you. Okay? Our emotions, sometimes our emotions are all over the place. We need to rein them in and not base our decision making on our emotions and then our will our choices how do you make your choices in life I choose to surrender my will to what you say what you want that is what it means your whole soul what does it mean with all your strength Oh, but I'm tired. I just want to lie here. Uh, 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 uh. Have you got any strength left within you? Yes. What does that mean? That means all of your strength. Use all of your strength in your serving and, in, in, and loving God. Use everything you have to love Him. Revelations 3 verse 15 to 17. One of the most scary scriptures in the whole of Bible. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wonder if he ri writes this to this church if he would be writing it to some people in this church today. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need, need a thing. But you do not realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Here Jesus, please note this is Jesus speaking, and he's saying you are neither hot nor cold. In other words, you lukewarm. A little bit here for God, a little bit for the world, and you ride the fence. God says, I wish you were one or the other. That is hard, hey? Eh? I wish that you were totally against me or that you are fully for me, but I don't want you half for me anymore. I'm sick of it. I know most married couples would, s would say the same, isn't it? If your spouse was being unfaithful to you, half faithful, half and would you want them in, in your life continuously? If there would come a point where you say, listen, I don't want to live like this anymore. Choose me or don't choose me. I, e even if you don't choose me, it would be better than you sitting on the fence. Uh, because I cannot take it anymore. That is what God is saying here. And God wants full commitment, 100% commitment. He does not want us any longer to sit on the fence in our relationship and our love for him anymore. God is saying, no longer lukewarm, no longer lukewarm, 100% boiling hot for me and me alone. See, if you stand for nothing, you will fail at everything, even in your relationship with God. So may we be fully committed to him. Hezekiah was fully committed to serving God and he led the whole of Israel to, to get rid of the idols. What is an idol in your life that you need to get rid of? What is something in your life that you put before God? Your recreation? Your work? Your making money? Your accomplishing things? Your marriage? Your children? W and we need to ask ourselves that question. What is it that I put before God? I adore my wife. She's amazing. But I cannot and should not and will not put her before God. And that is a decision I have to make. That is a decision every couple needs to make. That is including your children. You I hope all of you adore your children, which I know you do. Do you? they come before God? They should never. Arthur Gordon once said, nothing is easier than saying words. 
Nothing is harder than living them day after day. And that's why it's easy to say uh, your marriage vows. It is not as easy to live them out. It is easy to say, Lord, I choose to be committed fully to you. It is not as easy to live it out. But it is a choice we have to make he, in a, here first and then here and then live it. And not allow anything to hinder that. Not allow anything to hinder that because talk is cheap. And we need to remember that. It has been once told that a newly elected judge who had won office in a special country election, during his acceptance speech, he said, I wish to thank the 424 people who promised to vote for me. I wish to thank the 316 people who said that they voted for me. I wish to thank the 47 people who came out to vote last Thursday. And I wish to thank the 26 folks who actually did vote for me. How sick is that? How sick is that? Lord, I love you with all of my heart. I wonder when it comes to Judgment Day, how many of those that said it and how many of those will be seated in heavenly places with God. I really pray it's not according to their stats. Here you get all these people, 316 say, no, I voted for you, but actually, in actual fact, only 26 people actually voted for him. Only 40, 47 people actually went and voted. But only 26 really voted for him. Remember, talk's cheap. And may we not just be talkers. Maybe we, maybe we be doers. Because we are committed 100% to God. Number two, be fully committed to daily devotion with God. I think this is crucial. I don't think I know this is crucially important in your relationship, in your growth with him. Psalms 1 verse 1 through to 3, it says, Blessed is the man, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of, the s of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and, he, and in his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaves do not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Oh, sorry, forgive me. Whatever he does prospers. Who wants everything that they do to prosper? If you study God's word, you will know what he expects of you, how to live, how to run your finance, how to grow your business, how to run your family, and therefore it you will be pr prosperous. Why? Because you will live according to his ways, and his ways are brilliant. His ways are bring success. His ways bring prosperity. So may you spend time with him daily. Point three, be faithfully committed to the Sabbath rest. I want you to listen to what the scripture says here. Please note we're reading in the New Testament, not in the Old, okay? Hebrews 4 verse 9 to 11. So then a Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. Still remains? Okay. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labor as God did from his. What was God's labor? Creation. Okay. Six days he labored. On the seventh day he? He did nothing. He re and that was a principle that he wants us to live by. Then it says there verse 11. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through such disobedience as this. I believe that all of us need to have a Sabbath day rest. Okay? And I don't believe I don't believe for one second that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is the issue which day you choose to rest. I do believe, however, there needs to be a day of rest. 
Okay? And all of us need to say this day, which, and for us, most of us, I would say Sunday is our day of rest. This day is made for me. God ma made the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. It is not a day, an extra day for you to accumulate wealth or to do your normal things. It is a day for you to chill out and make sure that you get your relationship right with God and with man. It is a day where you to worship him. It is a day where you to get equipped. It is a day where you to come before him and to reassess your life and say, Lord, I'm sorry for these things I've done. Where is it that you're wanting me to change? That is the prime reason for the Sabbath. To rest, worship him, get equipped and realign your life. Not as another day of work. Now, if you, Asikov, if, if, let me not speak Afrikaans for the YouTubers, if there's something wrong and your, in Afrikaans they say, the calf is in his word, if there's something like that, God understands. Hello. He understands the, he, and he sees your heart. So chill out. God is not wanting us to be so legalistic that you can't walk two meters and that, that's not what he's saying. He's saying there's a, this is a principle that he wants us to live by. So may you, I, I, I want to encourage all of us to be committed to this. Be committed to a Sabbath day rest. Chill out. Re, le, allow your, your body to reclock itself. Allow your spirit to come in, into alignment where it's got out of alignment during the week. Hebrews 10 verse 25 said, Let us not give us meeting together, some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Who believes that the Lord's return is soon? Some of you. Do all of you? Even more so as you see the day approaching. Even more so, we need to be even more committed to meeting together, to getting better equipped. Because as the world gets darker, we, we, our light has to shine even so much more. So make sure that you're committed fully to Him. Point four, be fully committed to giving your tithes and offerings. The church at large financially is in distress. And why? It's because we do not, we're not committed to the kingdom of God. We're not committed to the spread of the gospel. We do not take what we are given and we say, Lord, I acknowledge that this is from you and here is, here is my worship offering of thanks to you. Malachi 3.10 verse says, uh, 11 says, bring the full tithe, not a portion, the full tithe into the storehouse where you get equipped so that there may be food in my house and, the, uh, and thus put, uh, and it says, in the, this is the one of the most beautiful things because only in this, passage in all of the Bible does it say and thus put me to the test says the Lord of hosts and see if I will not open the, the windows of heaven for you and pour out pour down for you sorry he heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing see if I will not provide supernaturally for you God will bless you but you need to choose to be committed to be being faithful I know my dad was in the red he, a pastor challenged him, or reverend at that time challenged him. Six months later was the first time ever in his whole career that he was out of the red. And he said to God, I'm the, I, uh, six months I'll try this. After that, no longer. If it works, fine. And it worked. God opened the floodgates of heaven and provided for him. We read in uh, Mark 12 verse 17, I always like to bring in this passage to just to bring the balance because it's in the New Testament. Then Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And obviously it's talking about money. In, in the context it's talking about money. Right? It's not talking about everything, it's talking about money. If you give everything you'll have nothing to live. That's not what it's talking about. So go and study that up and be encouraged by that and become faithful in that. Number five, be fully committed to honor your word. I think this is a very important one for us as believers. When you commit to something and you say, I'll do it, make sure you do it. Otherwise, don't commit to it. Rather just say, when there's time or 
when, when you give a deadline on a thing, you must know you need to adhere to that. Otherwise, rather say within this time frame. Don't say I'll see you tomorrow or whatever. It is dangerous, okay? James 5 verse 12 to 13. And I think all of us, f all of us slip up in this. Am I right? I'll do this and then we forget about it. And it wasn't intentional, but we committed to a thing and we forgot about it and then people see and think, but you're lying. But you didn't lie, you just shouldn't have committed to it. James 5 verse 12 to 13 says, Above all, my brother, uh, uh, my beloved, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other, uh, by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Just say yes, I will do that, or no, I won't do that. And many of us le le need to learn to say no. But some of us also need to learn to say yes. <laughs> Number six. Be fully committed to sharing the gospel with others. And this, to me, is a crucial, crucial part. What does it help us yearning to see our family and our friends going into the kingdom of God, but we never share the truth with them? And there are people that you get in contact with who I'll never get in contact with. There are people that have friends friendships with you where they are willing to open up to you, but they won't open up to me. And we cannot expect, well, it's this person's job or that pastor's. That's not true. It is all of our job to make sure that the gospel is spread throughout the world. So when you have someone that God's placed on your heart and there's an open door to share, speak the truth, but always in love. 2, two Corinthians 5 verse 19 to 20, it says there, that God was re reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of re reconciliation. Who did he commit the message of reconciliation to? You and I. To reconcile people that do not know him and serve him back into right relationship with God. He, God, chose to commit and give us that amazing ministry of reconciling people that are strained and away from God into a right relationship with Him. We are there, they, therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making His appeal through us. Do you know that God has appointed you? The minute you say, Lord, I give my life to you. I choose to be a son of God. I choose to be a daughter and I choose to be born again. The minute you're born again, you become an ambassador of God. Now you get some great ambassadors, but you also get some terrible ambassadors. And we are to represent our kingdom, our country, in a manner that is godly, that is righteous. Amen? Therefore, let's choose to be committed to be slaves of righteousness from here on out. Amen? 2, two uh, Chronicles 16 verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are are fully committed to him. And may we choose to be one of those hearts that he finds that are fully committed to him. And the minute you say, Lord, I choose to be committed fully to you, come and find me and help strengthen my commitment in this and this area. I battle in this area. Please come and help me. And you know what he will? So with every head bowed, every eye closed, you, you heard, we went through a couple of points. Where is it in your life you need to become more committed? Is it in your prayer life? Is it in your tithing? Is it in your loving Him? Serving other people? Sharing the truth? What area do you need to become more committed or even fully committed? In your heart, where you sit right now, I want to encourage you to make right with God and say, Lord, I have not been fully committed in this area or that area. I, from this day, choose to be fully committed. Would you do that as you sit there? Father, I pray your blessing upon every single person in this place. I pray for every person listening via YouTube, Lord, and I pray that all of us will choose to be fully committed to you, to give our whole hearts 
to you, not just a portion. And that we would from this day love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Not a portion of it, all of it. And that we will not ever again put anything before you. And we would be fully committed to your church, your body, your people, and those that do not know you. And that we would not shy back from telling the truth in love. Lord, we want to speak your oracles that will change people's hearts and lives and their destiny for eternity. And would you use us, we pray. Would you come and give us wisdom. And Lord, I pray that you would find us as your church, as your individual, as one that is fully committed. One that he loves you with everything and lives by it. Doesn't just speak, but we live it. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless every single person here. I pray that we would be a congregation that is fully committed to you, to one another, to this community and those that do not know you. And that we will be committed to share your truth in love. I pray that you would go with us our separate ways and that this week would be a week of total commitment. Thank you, Lord, for new beginnings. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're going to take us on on from glory to glory thank you that the work that you've begun within us you will take on into completion and so lord we give our hearts our souls our mind our strength completely to you and we choose to surrender all once again in jesus name amen and amen god bless you